I'm here in Hillsborough, North Carolina. And I want to welcome everybody to the VCCA Fireplace Series with poet Barbara Crooker and composer Greg Myrtle. Um, I also want to give a special thank you to Kim Doty, who is our producer behind the scenes and will be acting as magician and wizard as we um, have various slides and music <laughs> interviews um, during, during this program. Um, I'm excited to be back um, hosting uh, tonight and um, because of Barbara and Greg, and um, it gives me the opportunity to talk about one of the reasons that I love the VCCA. And um, so the first time I was a fellow was in 2007, 13 years ago, and um, both Greg and Barbara were there. And uh, we have stayed connected throughout time. And if any of you remember when it was your first time as a fellow, I felt like I was going to summer camp and all the other kids knew each other. <laughs> they were really cool. And I was this newbie. And I remember just thinking, oh my God, nobody's going to like me. And I'm going to be all alone. And Barbara and Greg were, became really good friends, as did others. And I think. Um, you know, this connection that, that we make and um, you know, that we make with so many of you who are watching both live and who will be watching later on is, is what matters so much to me about, about this community, about this organization. So, um, so we're going to have Barbara read first and then we're going to turn to Greg. And I just, Barbara, I just want to say a few words about you. Uh, so you're reading from your new book, I'm Glad Morning. And your full um, bio is on the BCCA website, but I really liked um, a little bit of what you wrote. So I want, I want to make sure that I read that. Uh, you have been a BCCA fellow 19 times since 1990. And you wrote, in real life, I'm the caregiver of my son who has autism. And without BCCA, I'd never have written anything, let alone nine books. <laughs> it took me so long to get a first book, 25 years, but who's counting? but it finally happened and other books followed. This was going to be my big year, a book in the Pitt Poetry Series. I was the keynote reader for two poetry conferences and had readings scheduled all over the country. And then along came COVID and poof, everything vanished. Well, not everything, Barbara. We are here and we're really <laughs> excited that, uh, that you are here. Well, thank you, Steve. It's wonderful to see you again, not just on Facebook, but almost in real life. Um, I want to thank um, everybody who's responsible for inviting me to be part of this fireplace reading series. I miss, I can't tell you how much I miss BCCA. Um, so this book was largely written both at Mount St. Angelo and also at Ovilar, where I've been twice. So I had the 19 residencies in Virginia, two in France. I loved each and every one for many different reasons. And the cover of this book is by BCCA visual artist, Kristen Herzog. So I wanted to make sure everybody got to see that. Um, and the actual um, title of the book, uh, the book was in progress when I went for my residency, um, but I didn't really have a title and I knew what poems were in there. And I was walking to the office one day with the lovely B. Booker and something about our conversation let the um, title of the book come to me, Some Glad Morning. I knew the book was elegiac in tone, but it's also a book filled with joy, I hope. The beauty and the mystery of the natural world in everyday life. And I hope it's gonna speak to a lot of you in these dark times to remember to look for things that are light. So I'm gonna read three poems from Virginia, three poems from France, unless um, I've got my timer going. So if I run out of time, I'll just wrap it up. But uh, here's the first poem. Um, I have my flashlight because it's really dark. It's about to storm. Um, this was written, uh, begun anyway, because I go through, oh, about 50 drafts for every poem. On the stone slab on the writer's studios that are on the right-hand side when you're looking at the barn, and there's this um, not particularly wonderful stone urn, but there was a bird on it, and the bird spoke to me, and here's the poem. The Mockingbird on the Stone Urn, decorated in grapes and lichen, says, what have you got for me, baby? Something to add to my bag of tricks, my slick and non-repeating repertoire, my way with the ladies? 
He's screeching at the wind vane for constantly turning. The mockingbird on the urn says, music is my life. I stitch together songs like Mennonite ladies at a quilting bee. A scrap of cardinal, a remnant of jay, nine patch of Carolina wren, threaded with the metallic strands of oriole and wood thrush. This is a bird who struts his stuff, knows how to display his gray and white, a flag twirler in a stadium, soaking up the crowd's applause. The mockingbird on the stone knows that life is long, art short, or is it the other way around? He is one acquainted with the night, wailing in the light of the full moon. He thinks I might need another glass of wine, preferably a Gevry Chambertin, the Mousse au Chocolat. Everything dark be belongs to the night, including him. The mockingbird flaps up and down, shakes his tail feathers, hurls himself into another arioso. He doesn't know the score or play the score. He is the score. He's putting on his top hat, tying on his white tie, brushing off his tails. He's putting on a blitzkrieg of sound and fury. So don't mess with his head, but follow his lead. Sing, sing, sing. I thought that might be a nice one for a night that's both poetry and music. So that, that's my hats off to you, Greg. And another thing I like to do in that Adirondack chair by the stone urn is make come back after dinner, work for a while, make myself a martini, go back inside, work for a while. I have two martini poems in this book. What can I tell you? Martini. Look how the olive green sun slowly slips into the cold shimmer of a glass of gin, the evening sky beginning to glow red as pimento behind the blue hills. Clouds spread out delicate as cocktail napkins and the birds begin their scat of warm-up trills, vibratos, little snips of phrases. I can hardly wait to see the evening sun go down. And this next one was written during a fall residency. I tried to alternate my goings and comings every 18 months, fall and spring. And one of the things that um, I made a little tradition for myself was to uh, bring a book of Charles Wright, a Virginia poet, along with me and read his new book and often got inspiration from it. Well, Charles is over 80 now and he says he's not writing any more books. So I've decided that my new tradition is gonna be going back to the beginning and reading Charles Wright all over again, if I get to come back. Reading Charles Wright on a fall afternoon, sitting in an Adirondack chair, paint peeled mostly off, just the pentimento of green, not a cloud anywhere, the pure blue verb of the sky. The sun slants down limitless, even as I'm feeling my days and how they are numbered. Wondering how many autumns I've got in the bank, how many words are left in the pen. In this postmodern world, we are not supposed to talk of the presence of God, but I know after surgery, someone came into the room invisible and held my hand. No birds are singing or flitting from bush to tree. Even the lawn seems to have given up, exhausted, exhaled its last green breath. The dead come back, but they no longer speak our language. Ring me like a bell in this brassy sunlight. Wash me clean. Speak in the tongue of flowers. The kudzu is covering the trees. They bend but do not break. And now I'll take you from Virginia to France, which is equally, equally wonderful. When I um, was there the last time, which might be my last time, I don't know. Um, two days before I left, I woke up in extreme pain and I had this pinched nerve in my back, which impacted my ability to walk. So it was a difficult um, residency, but I felt like, well, you only get a few 
things like this in your writing life. And I'd gone to a lot of trouble to arrange to go, so I went anyway. Pinch nerve. Happiness. The 10 short minutes when the scream of pain in my hip subsides. Here in a corner of southwest France, ginkgos spread their golden fans. There's a drift of dried leaves and wood smoke, a chittering in the trees. The gravel path is dotted with chestnuts, glossy as the coat of a roan colt. Comfort in the curve of my hand. I'm careful not to trip as I walk back to my studio in this village of honeyed stone. An ankle sprain would be more than I could bear. Nearby, the green garonne murmurs and chuckles as it runs to the sea. Take the pain with you, I beg to the water. It just shrugs and keeps on going. And I have to say that Sabine just took such good care of me um, while I was there and really unable to walk up the hill to the village. I'm eternally grateful. And she also took me on one of the back roads to see uh, this little statue, Petite Marie. Petite Marie, full of grace, you stand in the midst of a harvested field, stubble at your feet. Holy Mother, glazed in ceramic, your robes are the same blue-green of La Egaron, the color of shutters and doors. Your bare feet rest on a stone. Behind you, sunlight dips the leaves in precious metals, copper and bronze. Your eyes are cast down, hands folded, lips closed. Nearby in a neighboring tillage, someone in a sunlit vineyard is turning the blood of ordinary grapes into wine. And I'm going to end with a poem from the farmer's market, Tutti Frutti. All fruits, what my mouth never knew it desired. I can hear little Richard scream, Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy, a wop bop a luba, a lop bam boom. And I am back on the hardwood gym floor with my girlfriends, clustered in knots, boys on one side, girls on the other, no man's land in between. Both sides ache for someone to ask them to dance, but no one wants to take the first step, afraid of enemy fire. And here is this bread, Tutti Frutti, found at a farm stand in Balance d'Ajean. Clusters of dried fruit, apricots, golden raisins, figs, craisins, chunks of hazelnuts. The perfect partnership when toasted for slab of foie gras, its richness melting in the heat, a dance of unctuousness and crunch. Oh, Rudy. So many years of heartache and yearning, but now my mouth full of pleasure and decadence. Finally, I am in love. Thank you. Barbara, it is a delight to hear you read about it. Bring such life to your words. And um, I know you can't see the comments right now, or I don't think you can, but uh, Sarah, I don't can't now. Sarah Dorsey says, delicious. Um, Christine. Oh, Sarah. Killer last line. It was one of the earlier poems. Um, uh, kudos to Sabine and um, just, just really um, wonderful um, comments going on there. Um, before we move to Greg, Martini, gin or vodka? Both. <laughs> I alternate. It's <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So um, thank you for listening. Please um, post any questions in the comments field on, on either on Facebook or YouTube. We'll be coming to all questions after Greg um, Greg's section. And now we're going to turn to Greg Myrtle, who I believe is uh, far afield in San Paulo, Brazil. Is that right, Mr. Myrtle? That's correct, yes. Well, you are our furthest fellow. And um, I know that um, your bio also is on the BCCA website. And you are going to be showing us, playing for us in some way, Pictures Without an Exhibition, which is for pianist Heather Lanners. And um, one thing that I love that the Boston Globe has written about you is 
Greg Myrtle, a talent the ear wants to follow wherever it goes. And we are following you to Brazil right now. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so yeah, just to re reiterate, reiterate the idea of the VCCA family. Um, I also was a first time fellow in 2007 when I met Stephen. And so, uh, and I've been there several times since. Uh, and it's such a great community with so many wonderful people. I can't even begin to spit, do the shout outs uh, because I'd be here till the end of my time. So a uh, hello to all of you and thank you so much for coming and for spending this time with us. Um, and thank you, Barbara, for your work and, um, and your reading. So this work is called Pictures Without an Exhibition and it's for solo piano. Um, and those of you who are lovers of classical music will, will know immediately because of the title what it's inspired by. Uh, Mussorgsky in the 19th century, in the mid, mid 19th century wrote um, a great work for solo piano called Pictures at an Exhibition. And in it, he had um, depictions of uh, the paintings of a dear friend of his who had just died and had a retrospective. And uh, it's such a great, great work. Um, one of the many sources of inspiration was his promenade theme, which uh, those of you might recognize as da da di da 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 di da da di da da. And that's a theme that will come back many times uh, over the course of the work. And it's called a promenade theme because essentially that music walks you from one painting to another. And so I decided to use that as a starting point. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from the repertoire uh, that I love so deeply. And I created what I'm calling an air and the way that he uses glue between uh, the paintings and his pictures, I'm using this air in four variations to um, fit between the larger um, movements. So if we could bring up the movement structure, you'll see, um, you'll see here that there are the five numbers are the main movements. Uh, so the lento, la poule, which I will play at the end tonight, um, the scherzo, and then um, and then the the languorous clouds and ballad, and in between that is the air, the second air, the third air, and the fourth air. So my intention with that um, coming out of the um, Mussorgsky idea was to give a, a, a kind of glue and something familiar for the listener to return to after each picture, let's say, or each movement. Um, my movements are not specifically drawn from visuals. In fact, the idea of pictures without an exhibition is that they're sort of pictures in sound, but, um, but the air follows this idea of a, of, of a kind of promenade or, or a, a link that, that um, goes through the entire piece. So we'll listen to that first air. Uh, one of the, the ideas that I had um, in a long work, because uh, it lasts about 35, uh, 37 minutes, um, it's a sort of a uh, an exploration of moments of great richness, let's say, and potentially complexity, and also of great simplicity. And you'll notice in this air, it's really just a melody for the right hand alone. And this is Heather Lanners, this pianist. And I don't think we have sound right now. Uh, so we'll try that one more time. And then just to um, give you a, a sense of, of what I'm gonna play, the, I, I wanted to feature Heather Lanners playing the air then the third air, which will be like a variation of that. And then we'll go to the uh, piece that I wrote here at VCCA.
and that's the error. So very short and very simple. And now we move to the third air. Um, so the melody again is da di da da di da 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 di da. And now you'll hear that in a kind of a new context, in a contrapuntal context, um, on the top line. And it's gonna what was a forty-five second piece suddenly stretches out to, to two minutes. So um, things, little secret things, happen in there to broaden the, the idea and broaden the theme. So I hope you were able to all follow along. Um, it's hard to do that on a first hearing, but to get a little sense of the theme and then well, when I sang it one more time and then to hear what happens to it in its third or its its second iteration, its second variation, let's say. So the third, second air, third air. And then just for your information, I wrote the fourth air. I completed that at BCCA. And now we'll move to... Um, the La Poule, which I've entitled in French because there's a link to another composer, uh, Jean-Philippe Rameau, uh, who wrote a great piece called La Poule for the harpsichord. Uh, pianists also play it a lot. And that became uh, an inspiration for the second movement in the big picture structure. So again, there's the lento, the air, La Poule, second um, air, a scherzo, a third air, languorous clouds, a fourth air, and finally the ballad that finishes the piece. My hands didn't have enough space to do all of that. Uh, <laughs> so we'll go to the um, La Poule, which is essentially translated as the hen. And it shows an aspect of, I don't consciously think about being humorous, but I do admire humor uh, so deeply in music because it's very hard to do. Um, I think one of the greats is, is Haydn, um, who seems to be able to make you smile, wink, laugh all the time. Um, but uh, uh, I'm trying to do that somehow with this, uh, with his hen. Um, as a sort of inside joke, Heather and I have talked about this as a chicken too, but of course there, there is a subtle difference between the way we hear those two words. Um, so here finally is Heather playing the movement that I completed at VCCA called La Poule.
So that uh, that's that's at least a version of the hand. Um, I hope some of you have felt the you know the the the, the play the the humor you know, that's um, in that piece. And I think um, I have to uh, give a special thank you to Heather Manners for having commissioned this piece, uh, being its dedicatee, and also playing it so beautifully. There's a real sense of uh, ownership that she has. I think. Um, that comes across quite quite beautifully because she plays it so um, so fully so solidly. So we've also just for your information we've created a, a video with a discussion beforehand of the entire piece. Um, so those of you who are curious to hear more um, and to see how the air maybe works in the in the whole piece, uh, you can you can um, go over to YouTube to that link and uh, listen to it on your free time. So thank you so much for, for having me and for having us and uh, hand it back to Stephen. Well, thank you, Greg. This reminds me of when I was in the Corn Crib writing studio and you were in the composer studio in, in the back, just creating, creating all of this joy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Uh, let me just say both to um, Anastasia from Berlin and um, Jane from, I believe, Colorado Springs, if you missed a little bit of this, the full stream will be available um, forever on both YouTube and Facebook. And, um, we have a couple of questions for each of you. So let me start, um, let me start with this question for you, Greg. Um, do you work with choreographers ever? I do, and I, and I have, yeah. 
Um, part of the reason that I'm here in Brazil right now is that my first work with a choreographer was with a Brazilian choreographer. And uh, we did a piece together, an electronic piece um, based on the seasons called Spiral Cycle. And um, so I do love to work with choreographers when the, you know, when the collaboration is right. Um, and it's thanks to him that I first came to Brazil because we were going to start another work after that. So thanks for the question. And so you sing, you compose, do you dance as well? I, I wish I, I can fake it, but I wish, you know, I were a great dancer. <laughs> Me too. Um, Barbara, Christine um, Fisher Guy asks, where does a poem begin with you? A lump in the throat, an image, a line, a voice? The answer to that would be yes, all of those. <laughs> and it varies from poem to poem. It's one of the reasons I like to write outside um, at VC or in Ovilar, um, because the images are there, just you have to snatch them out of the air. And then, um, Barbara, this is for you also. Um, Betty Joyce Nash is asking, do you really revise a poem oh. 50 times? I Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you get gifts, a poem that pretty much comes out and the first draft is pretty much how it's going to be. But most of them are worked and reworked and worked again. And I just keep working until it feels right. That's great. Um, great. <laughs> uh, it was the, the, I was going to say the uh, Paul Verlaine, the uh, French writer, said that a poem is never finished; it's merely abandoned, and mm -hmm. you know that's part of it, also. And Greg, where do your inspirations come from? Um, it, it it always varies. I mean, certainly, what I was talking about as uh, re inspiration coming from the repertoire, some of the music that I care about so deeply. So that's a clear influence for this piece, for example, but also the performer is hugely important for me. So uh, I, I came to know Heather's playing through uh, her performance of various works, but also two earlier solo piano pieces of mine. So that when she asked me to write this major work, um, it was a perfect fit because I, I understood her personality at the piano, both as a human being, but also as a pianist. Um, and so that informed the work a lot. Um, the fact that there are so many diverse pictures in it, um, the intention behind that was to give her the ability to express herself pianistically in all these various ways. Um, so that's definitely a source. And then the other thing is that the, it's hard to articulate, but the sound of music, the actual, what that thing is, a harmony, a line, a melody, that becomes the impetus for the work. So I'm often a what we call a bottom-up composer as opposed to a top-down. So I don't create an entire structure and then sort of place the music within, it, within that structure. I have a dialogue with the music. So something happens and I discover maybe a melody like the air and then I, I learn, it tells me what it needs to become. And so I think that, you know, that it's shown in this piece because the air became an air two, air three, air four. And that suddenly, you know, it hits you one day, and you're like, oh, I could do that with that. And to me, that's a, a conversation, a dialogue I'm having with the music. So it's something that gets my brain out of it and my ego out of it, and it becomes a place of receptivity. So that's a hugely important part of my working process. Thank you, Greg. So I, have, I have one last question of my own to the two of you, and I'll, I'll preface it um, with partly my own answer. And, and the question is, how do, you find, how do you find inspiration? How do you find light? How do you find joy in these, in these dark days, in these dark times? And um, uh, for myself, I struggle with that would be my, my most honest answer. And then I have been, um, some of you who follow me on Facebook know, I, I try to, I take photographs um, with my iPhone and I try to find everyday beauty wherever. And it doesn't need to be a beautiful flower. It doesn't need to be a sunset. There, there's beauty and I'm looking out my window, there's a 
there's a North Carolina brick just sitting there. Um, and so that kind of reorients me during the day to, to see a little bit differently and, and shifts my energy. So Barbara, why don't you start first? Um, because I heard, I heard much light in your work. <laughs> and I, of course I do have a lot of darker pieces as well. Um, and also just to play off something that, that Greg had just said, um, I try to listen to the work, tell me where it wants to go rather than direct it. Um, but yeah, I think Steve, you've got that point that we have to actively, active listening, active looking for those glimpses of beauty right now because the world is certainly very dark indeed. It's a little um, disorienting coming to this after just having watched the evening news where it's all bad one thing after another. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, we have to be receptive to beauty or we need it. And one of my poems, the, the image of beauty was from an oil spill on a, a city street, which is not something traditionally thought of as an object of beauty, but the poem unfolded from that. Thank you. And Greg, you may have the last word, sir. Yeah, well, um, I mean, one, one of the great inspirations are other people's creative uh, output, you know? And so to be able to spend time reading a great novel or listening to, to music without, I, I think it's really important. I haven't been creating much during this period just to, to be as mm -hmm. honest as you have been, but I feel like things are fermenting. And so um, at a certain point, things will come out, but, um, you know, to, to, to go listen or to, uh, someone was asking if I play the piano. So I do play the piano and I was, I've been playing Bach on the piano and that just, as long as I'm not looking for it to do something for me, to get me to a certain place and I'm just really present to it, then it does its healing, connecting work. And that's such a, we have such a privilege to be in this life doing this as artists because we connect to that so deeply and so thoroughly and um you know what, what a gift we have we have our struggles but man we we have some gifts so uh, i think we're all grateful for that well i'm grateful to the two of you for sharing this screen with with us and with everyone who's watching um, it's been a real pleasure. I want to also thank uh, Kim Doty again, our Director of Communications, for everything that she does for us and for the um, extra slide and uh, so on work with the music and, and everything tonight. And um, this stream will live on and um, we will be back in two weeks with two other BCCA fellows. So um, stay well, stay safe, and until then, thank you. <laughs>